Right, so the recording has started. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to the Nurture podcast series brought to you by the European Oncology Nursing Society and the Nurture Research Project. I will be your host for this session. I'm Greg Kutranoulas. I am a cancer nurse by background and associate professor in cancer survivorship at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And today, we are exploring the concept of self-care as it relates to oncology nursing practice. So to better understand this, this concept, we are joined by uh, Debbie Boyle, a very high caliber uh, nurse um, with years of experience as a, an oncology nurse uh, specialist and um, having several leadership roles in, in her career and very uh, important advocacy roles as well in, uh, in terms of advanced practice nursing and cancer survivorship and to support um, the skills and well-being of nurses as well. So uh, welcome, Debbie. It's Thank a you, great Greg. pleasure to have you. Nice to be here. So, um, as I said, um, the focus of this podcast today is on self-care. So we know that uh, we talk a lot about how important self-care and self-management and supporting the self-care skills and abilities of patients and families um, who are affected by cancer is. But what do we mean by self-care for health professionals, for health providers particularly? I've heard it said, and I like this definition, that uh, self-care for nurses in particular is caring for yourself as if you were your best friend and thinking about the attentiveness to um, how you are functioning emotionally, physically, socially, spiritually, as it relates to the, the stresses associated with our chosen specialty and our willingness to be present uh, to ourselves and sensitive and introspective of some of the demands that we are experiencing as a result for caring for our patients and families. Um, threatened by a very life-threatening illness. So looking at yourself and what your needs are as if you were your best friend. That's a very important statement, very powerful. Um, so if we are to consider oncology nursing practice particularly, what are the demands of oncology that really place self-care in that very important position in what we do. I, I think it's important to look at self-care needs within the context of what the demands are of our specialty. And we are um, immersed with the care of vulnerable patients and their caregivers, um, threatened by probably the most feared um, illness that all, in all our societies. and. As a result of that, we are um, somewhat pariahs of note because we're working in, in an area where the, the, the scare about a premature death uh, predominates, even for patients that go on to become long-term survivors, just the threat of being diagnosed with cancer and what that means. And so we're, we're working with, with a cohort of patients that are very unique. They're, they, the emotional wear and tear on them is very significant. And um, so I think we have to look at the angst and the tension um, of what is involved in our work setting on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. And so as a result of being a caring uh, person and by the definition of nursing is that we are nurturers, which is the great name that um, Eons has given to this project. Um, and so the compassion that we feel towards what our patients are experience is um, somewhat a double-edged sword. It makes us 
very good at what we do. But on the other hand, uh, that compassion can get us into trouble because it's very cumulative. Um, we need to expend a lot of compassion with all of our patients um, and caregivers. So when I think of how many people we are caring for that need our compassion and nurturance, we need to double it because we double the number of patients because there almost always is a family caregiver by the patient's side who needs that as well. And so when you look at um, even on a weekly, a monthly, and certainly on a yearly basis, the um, expenditure of compassion, our concern as we stand by and witness the tragedies that our patients are experiencing, whether it be bad news, whether it be um, an initial diagnosis, whether it be news that um, prior therapies have been futile, um, it's hard not to be compassionate and expend that emotional energy towards what our patients are experiencing. And you multiply that over time and you can see where um, we get to a point where unless we're taking care of ourselves, there's just no energy left in the battery uh, for us to expend. And so our care, self-care needs to be very purposeful uh, and look to ways in which we can nurture ourselves so we can in turn continue to be very compassionate nurses. Absolutely, absolutely. So that being said, what are the potential benefits you think of, of self-care? So if someone was to apply self-care to their own uh, practice and to their own realities of um, being out there for patients and, and families, and um, what are the potential, um, wh why is it important, do you think? I think um, it certainly affects um, our retention, um, our, our presence when we are at work. And um, I think our, if we, a good exercise I often suggest is to go home, um, let's say after hearing this podcast, and say to your family, um, can you tell when mom or dad has had a rough day at work or what is and what is it like for you when I come home and you can you can you yourself can see it's been a rough day and um, how am I interacting with you as a family uh, you may think you're doing a great job at hiding it or are not showing again some of this this drain that you feel as a result of what you've experienced at work but your family will tell you that, uh, oh no, they can tell. Uh, and the same is true with many of our coworkers. And I think that is a good um, discussion piece to have, whether it be in staff meetings, um, at work, uh, at the dinner table periodically. Um, tell me what, what you see in mom or dad when I, when I come home, am I less present for you? Um, am I short tempered? Um, do I want to isolate myself? Uh, what are sort of the signs that you see? And you may be, we all may be amazed at what our, our loved ones and our coworkers are experienced. And many times they are very able to articulate the change in our, in our uh, work presence and our home presence as a result of what we are bringing home with us or bringing into work uh, the next day. It really helps uh, us understand that this is not invisible, that it is something that we see many times um, rear its head in places other than um, the immediate work setting. That's great, eh? I think that's, that's very important. So if I, if I said now that I, if I did something to look after myself, who's likely to benefit from it? Do you think? Is it uh, just me? Yes, I think related to what I just mentioned, it's it's. Yeah. I think um, our coworkers, um, our family, um, I think our patients and their families, because when we are uh, when there's no water in the well and we 
haven't been good at um, uh, building up our battery to, to be able to take care of these patients and families in need. Uh, what we see may be symptoms of uh, cynicism at work, being short-tempered, um, not as willing to engage in perhaps some difficult conversations, um, perhaps uh, a little bit more conflict at work. And so there are symptoms, again, when we are, are not um, engaging in self-care that others uh, certainly can point out to us if we ask them. So it's not just something internal in ourselves. It does osmos into the workplace and also into um, our family life as well. Absolutely. So the, the symptoms of not using self-care are visible to ourselves as well. And mm -hmm. vice versa, the, the, the good signs of using self-care can be visible mm -hmm. to, to other people around us. Absolutely. So if we were now to think about self-care, about what it is, um, what kind of examples of self-care activities can we offer to our audience? I think... Um, everyone needs to come up with a menu for themselves of what taking care of oneself looks like and what might be helpful for me might look very different um, for you greg and so there's not a uniform uh, list or compilation of interventions that work for all of us but i think it it behooves us to sit down and uh, make a list of things that we value and that we would see as taking care of ourselves. Many years ago, I was in a, in a classroom setting and the uh, lecturer had us write a list of 30 things that we could do to take better care of ourselves. And, as one of the people in the audience, we were all looking at each other saying 30 things, how could I possibly come up with 30 things? But his intention was for us to write them down, make them visible, um, make them obviously very personal for what would be helpful for each one of us. And his message was for us to look at those on a daily basis and to pick one, and it doesn't have to take two hours or whatever, um, but th the, the strategy being that when you write it out and you make it visible, and maybe you, you put it somewhere where you see it first thing in the morning on a mirror in the refrigerator or whatever, and it makes it, um, it, it, it makes it more poignant for you in terms of saying, okay, from this list, what am I going to do today? It may be as um, simple as taking 10 minutes at break to decompress and do some reflection. Uh, it may be, um, again, doing something like um, mindfulness, meditation, uh, but taking that time out that we need for ourselves where we're not always extending ourselves outward to other people, but we're taking that 10, 10 minutes to turn that care into oneself. And, say, and the important underlying premise of all this is that we have to know that we're worth it. And in order for us to sustain ourselves in this specialty where we are always seem to be um, extending ourselves outwards to others, that we are not going to be effective unless we take the time to take care of ourselves. And I think it's realistic for us to think of we could take 10 minutes a day to do that. And so it would be an interesting exercise for the listeners to do that same exercise and see uh, I, I found, I thought, oh, there's no way I could come up with 30 things, um, you know, in a fairly short period of time. But I was able to. When you, you um, think of things that, again, may be small or, or 
uh, take 10 minutes to do, but um, it is doable. And as long as you see yourself as worthy of taking that 10 minutes of time of reflection um, and give it a try, that gets you started on, on the right foot. Yes, that's a very, very, very important point that you made. Just, just uh, the, the last one about realizing that you need this time to yourself mm -hmm. for self care. So, totally agree with you on that. Um, so, um, so Debbie, do you have a, a personal experience of self care that you've used yourself and you found it worked well? Do you, do you have an example? Of Oh, something that worked well for you. I know that it might not work for someone else, but right. um, I'm just looking for an example. Um, yes, there's yes. several that that, I, that have worked for me. Um, I personally have found journaling to be very helpful. And I would keep um, on me a, a pad or a small notebook. And um, when I was in a situation where I was struggling or feeling low or frustrated or whatever, uh, what I found is many times we're not aware of those thoughts of perhaps what's causing it or what's behind it. And I would jot myself, write myself a note and, you know, say, why, why am I um, feeling so bad about this situation? And I would be amazed at what would come out of my head uh, in terms of uh, what the impetus was for those feelings. You know, I feel bad because um, the patient's wife reminds me so much uh, of my mother when she was ill. Um, I, I feel bad because I wish I could do more. I feel impotent that I can't um, change this, this awful situation around. So for me, I found the journaling to be very um, self-reflective and make me more aware of where feelings are coming from that might make me feel down. And the second thing that I, I do that I found works for me is I, on my way home from work, I uh, started a ritual where when I would turn on the keys to the car, put on the seat belt, I would take just a few minutes to reflect on what I did well that day, where I was successful, uh, how I made a difference, uh, because I tend to be one of those people that would say, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I could have done that, I should have done that, and I need to consciously take those negative thoughts and feelings and turn them around and reframe them it to help me reflect on where I was, where I did make a difference that day. And so I found myself each day, uh, again, getting ready to go home and to say, you know, I was able to lobby for a change in that pain medication. You know, I did find that 10 minutes to sit down with the patient's wife. I, I, I could just see how anxious and worried she was. And I found the time, I made the time to sit down with her. So I took the time to pat myself on the back and to acknowledge the successes rather than the opposite of those instances where perhaps uh, something different should have done. And so I, I find rituals to be very helpful. I, I, I I often tell the story of a nurse in a workshop who said, wrote, rose her hand and said, uh, what I do is when I come home, I take my keys and I open the drawer in the hallway where I come in from the doorway and I put my keys in the top drawer so I, I don't lose them and I know where they are. And I also um, say to myself, I'm putting the stresses that I experienced today that I feel I'm putting them in the drawer and I'm shutting the drawer and I'm not going to uh, take all that home with me and have it influence the rest of my day. So that's another example um, of a ritual. Uh, so it's again, highly, highly individualized. Some people may want to go for a walk 
at lunchtime and sort of get out of the immediate unit setting. But there's a whole host of, of different things that people can come up with. And again, they don't have to be lengthy. They can be short um, interventions that are meaningful to you. And that's the most critical thing, what, that these interventions have to nurture your soul and your being so that you can sustain yourself and go back into these rooms where you know there is hardship and suffering on the other side of the door. You're, you're, you're charging your battery so that you're able to do that effectively. Yes, absolutely. And I think the, another important thing, as you said, is just making sure that you're actively taking the time, time to, to reflect on those things. So it doesn't happen automatically. So, you, so each one of us will have to, to do it consciously. Um, um, looking after themselves. So if we were now to consider things that to not count as self-care, because that doesn't come again automatically to every one of us, what we could be doing to support ourselves, to look after ourselves. Is there anything that you that you say doesn't count as self-care? It might do harm instead of good. Well, I think if uh, the biggest example that comes to mind, if if one is self medicating with um, alcohol or, or other substances as a way to minimize feelings, what I often use the analogy of swallowing one's sadness, uh, rather than acknowledging it and and the norm, the normality of feeling sad and down. Again, by virtue of our specialty, we are immersed in suffering around us with our patients and families. And it's hard for us not to, for that to osmos um, into us. But if we find ourselves looking for ways to substitute, uh, uh, use methods to substitute uh, how to deal with those feelings rather than acknowledge them, and we're causing ourselves more harm than good, uh, that certainly um, is a red flag that more help is needed. Um, and I think, um, again, in, in the work setting, some of the interventions that are, are being addressed, I think, are empowering the nurses each uh, themselves to be able to reflect on when they are seeing signs and symptoms that a coworker is struggling and feeling, giving them the communication skills, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to be able to say, um, I'm worried about you. Um, I, I'm, you don't seem to have the same uh, vigor and interest in your nursing as you did before, or, um, you know, when we go out to dinner, it seems, you know, you're always drinking a lot of wine. Um, and is are you finding that that's an occurrence for you to help you deal with some of your feelings? So also looking at ways in which we can have these conversations with each other. But when the intervention is harming us rather than helping us, uh, that's again when uh, we should be cautioned that let's look at another way to deal with and normalize again the feelings of sadness and difficulty that the person may be experiencing. Yes, yes. And, and do you find that sometimes people might need, I mean, in terms of healthcare providers, oncology nurses, might need self care? more um, if they are more junior, more senior, um, or mm -hmm. the, we have discussed about how important it is to, to look after ourselves uh, throughout our practice and take this time to, to reflect. But would you feel that there are specific groups of, um, mm -hmm. of 
providers that might need this a, a little bit more compared to others, or is it going to be mm -hmm. the same thing for, for, for everyone? Well, first of all, I think um, in our basic edu nursing education programs, we do our, a disservice by not mentioning that this may be one of the hardest um, hardest strategies to master going into nursing is that uh, we we may uh, over overextend ourselves at periods of time, and we we will have feelings of impotency and wanting to do more and frustration and whatever, but we don't give them the anticipatory guidance that students need to hear when they go in and they start nursing. Now, none of us have ever had that, you know, certainly the old timers like myself as well. And over the years, we've had to learn on our own how to find that balance. But I think all nurses need it, whether you're new or whether you are experienced. Uh, but certainly I think, and, and the literature does attest to this, that it is the newer nurses um, within the one, one to two years out that um, may suffer the most in not knowing how to take better care of themselves. And I think one strategy would be to, to tell nurses to, you know, um, ask the senior nurses uh, to mentor you and give you help and say, how did you handle this uh, when you were struggling with a patient's death? and you found yourself continuing to think about um, uh, their transfer to the ICU or their code or whatever. So ask the senior nurses, um, us, although I, I should take that back, ask the senior nurse who seems to you that continues to practice very efficiently in terms of their interpersonal skills and their care for themselves. Uh, don't ask the nurse who's very negative and very cynical. Um, and, you know, I, I think those kind of characteristics that are not real positive are, again, are, are those in which you're not may necessarily learn some healthy coping skills, but ask the, the more senior nurses and um, for their advice of what worked for them, what didn't work for them. Um, but I think all I would suspect that the senior nurses have found a way to find that balance that's needed. Those that have been there for many years that continue to excel in their practice, to be emotionally present for their patients and families, they've found their niche over time. Um, and without a lot of, probably without a lot of support, but on their own, but um, <clears throat> I think that would be a good strategy because it doesn't mean when they seem to be doing well that, they're, that they don't need self-care. It may be that they found their way to nurture themselves that works. And so to ask for their help, um, for, to help you and guide you in terms of what might, what might be the best strategy for you to consider. Yes, I agree, particularly senior nurses who, as you said, have, have worked for many years and, have, and keep excelling in what they're doing. They have, mm -hmm. they have put all of this empirical wisdom in practice and mm -hmm. to look after themselves. And I think it's this mentoring and it's uh, working as role models um, that in the end will help those more junior ones to, um, to get to that stage of looking after themselves and continuing to do what they, what they do best. Mm -hmm. So as we're heading towards the, the end of this conversation, so uh, I'd like to ask, uh, to ask Debbie if you have any final bits of advice in terms of self-care, any, any last messages, any, anything that you'd like our audience to remember um, as a take-home message? Uh, my experience has been in talking with nurses over the years about this is that one of the biggest barriers is not enough time. And um, 
in our contemporary society, I ask them to think about how much time they're spending on their cell phone uh, on a daily basis. And the cell, you can get these feed, the feedback from your cell phone that'll say, you spent an average of three hours today uh, you know, on your cell phone. And I say, look at the amount of time you're spending doing some of these kind of activities and say to yourself, yes, there, there I can find time. I can insert pages um, here and times for it to become internalized to your everyday uh, experience. So it, it takes consistency. Again, it takes the, the sense of worthiness that I need this to sustain myself. Um, and, and again, the, um, the commitment some people feel that they can do self-care better when they do it with a partner or whether it be a walk or whether it be having, you know, lunch once a week with somebody who is a good mentor with you. But you can make time when you look at where you're spending your time doing other things. And something like even a half hour a week or uh, two or three times a week is something that you can integrate into your daily routine, as long as you have see yourself as being worthy and and that is a necessary part of uh, sustaining yourself as an oncology nurse. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I think this is the, the, the end of, the, of this, this podcast. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and wisdom with, with us. Um, certainly, that was a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, thank you, thank you, everyone, for making the time to listen to this this important podcast and making also the time for yourselves to look after yourselves, as Debbie has shared with us. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.